Good evening. Hello and welcome. You're with the news today, Friday night, ahead of the weekend. This is your primetime destination news. Newsmakers, talking points. The big talking point tonight, fact checker Mohammad Zubair has got bail in one case, but he faces several other FIRs. It's become a new trend. Multiple FIRs are FIRs being weaponized, not just in this case, but in many others. We'll have that too on the news today. And is the United Kingdom ready for Rishi Sunak? We're going to be talking about that to a Tory House of Lords member. But first, as always, it's time for the nine headlines at nine tonight. The rupee is at a record low for the fifth consecutive day. Recovers eight paise to close at 79.91 against the US dollar. Alt News co-founder Mohammad Zubair granted bail by a Delhi court for a 2018 tweet. Zubair to remain in jail though pending relief in a series of other cases that have now been filed against him. Heavy rains in Mumbai and Pune. Red alert issued in eight Gujarat districts. Over 400 people dead across India's monsoon fury continues to wreak havoc. Massive showdown ahead of the monsoon session. Opposition slams. No protest in parliament. Notice says nothing is going to stop them from protesting. Government points out it's a circular from the UPA days. Spiritual leader Dalai Lama sends a strong message to China amidst his Ladakh visit seeking meaningful autonomy for Tibet. Says that China and India should resolve differences through talks. Government to introduce a bill in parliament to regulate digital media now. If passed, the law to bring digital media will come on par with newspapers. Showdown over namaz at Lucknow's Lulu Mao Mall peaks. Hindu groups seek not to recite Hanuman Chalisa inside the mall now. Security beefed up. Big win for India's defense autonomy. US waves cats are sanctioned over India's 400, S-400 missile deal with Russia. And Sri Lankan speaker announces the resignation of President Godbaya Rajapaksha who fled to Singapore. Protesters celebrate new president to be appointed on the 22nd of July. But the breaking story that's coming in at the moment this week, the Narendra Modi government ahead of the parliament session has moved to regulate digital media. Sources telling India today, government set to bring in legislation to regulate digital news media industry in this session. The new bill to be taken up by the cabinet proposes to bring digital news portals on par with newspapers. Digital platforms may be asked to register the entity with the press registrar general. Effectively, that would be equivalent of the prevalent registrar of newspapers in India. What it means is essentially government could regulate digital media. Or well, that's what many DG, digital media outlets now fear could happen. Rahul Srivastava, our national affairs editor who's been tracking that story, joins us. Rahul, what does this really mean? Does this give the government power to regulate the growing proliferation of digital news media channels across the country? See, Rajdeep, on the face of it, the government is trying to make it that this is one great big good step forward. It says that the bill proposes to do away with the existing procedure of furnishing declaration by publishers and printers before the district magistrate. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it says the draft bill which was circulated in 29, which have faced a lot of opposition from the stakeholders, it says that the process of title and registration of periodicals, including newspapers, is proposed to be effected centrally by the press registrar general's office. Now, this is where Rajdeep the trouble comes in. Because what people are viewing it with a sense of suspicion is the license and regulation element, Rajdeep. That license and regulation element is worrying the people because any registration comes with a punitive or penalty in form of deregistration. Now, what are the grounds which are created usually? If you see the draft bill 2019, it has a threat to the state. For example, security of the state, which is an undefined uh, vastness mm -hmm. under which you will see a lot many people who are in jail today. Now, in that scenario, there is a sense of worry that Rajdeep in 1824, Rajamon Rai had written a letter to the SC of Supreme Court of Adjudicator at Fort Williams against this very act, against the act called the Press and Registration of Books Act 1867. He had said that these declared rules for registration are being eventually prescribed, will throttle the freedom of the press. Now, it is virtually a, a title which is going to, the new bill is going to replace the old law. No, so, so does that mean, exactly does that mean if I'm a that? YouTube, if I'm setting up a YouTube channel also tomorrow, 
I will have to, in a sense, register myself, take a license. You see, Rajdeep, I will read out from the draft bill 2019, which had a definition of the digital media. It says, news on digital media is the news in digitized format that can be transmitted over the internet, computer, or mobile networks and includes text, audio, video, and graphics. That means that anybody is setting even on a YouTube channel or even on a, or maybe those snippets which come on mobiles, mm -hmm. everything needs to be registered. And there, there is a penalty of deregistration. Right. And I think that's where the stakeholders were against it in 2019 and it was buried, but it's likely to be coming to the cabinet very soon. One will have to say to see what exactly has been the monumental change right. that will make it acceptable to them. Okay, Rahul Srivastava with our big breaking story this evening. That's something to look forward to in the monsoon session that starts next week. Remember, thanks very much for joining me. Let's turn from there to uh, a related story in a way because Alt News, a fact-checking site in the digital media world, has been in the news for the last few days. Its co-founder, Mohammed Zubair, who has been accused of putting out tweets that, according to uh, the police, was inciting hatred, has finally got bail in a case that was filed against him in Delhi for allegedly offending religious sentiments. But he will stay in jail because the Uttar Pradesh police has filed six other cases across the state and he has got bail in only one of them. All of this comes in a week where the Supreme Court has increasingly said you must give bail not jail. India cannot become a police state with wrongful arrests. Let's take a look at what the Delhi court today said in the Zubair case and then we'll widen the debate. Are we becoming a police state? Take a look. A Delhi court on Friday granted bail to Alt News co-founder Mohammad Zubair in a case filed for allegedly offending religious sentiments and violating foreign exchange laws. Zubair was booked by Delhi police over a 2018 tweet which was called offensive by an anonymous complainant on Twitter. In the tweet, Zubair had shared a screenshot from the 1983 Hindi movie Kisi Sena Kehna to comment on the state of the country before and after 2014. Additional sessions judge in the bail order said that the tweet points to a political party. The judge said, criticism of a party is not enough to invoke sections 153A and 295A that deals with deliberate acts to hurt religious feelings. The bail order says that democracy cannot prosper unless people share their views. The judge adds that free speech is the proper foundation of a democratic society. The judge also says voice of dissent is necessary for a healthy democracy. The Delhi police had added sections under Foreign Contribution Regulation Act or FCRA against Zubair later. On this, the judge said that the accused has prima facie taken due diligence under Section 39 of FCRA. While Zubair has got bail, he is unlikely to be released from jail. This is because Zubair till now has got bail only in the cases filed in Delhi and Sitapur. The fact checker is also booked in two FIRs in Hathras, one each in Lakhimpur Kheri, Ghaziabad and Muzaffarnagar districts. Zubair has moved the Supreme Court on Thursday, seeking quashing of the six FIRs filed against him in various districts of Uttar Pradesh or to club investigation of these FIRs with the investigation in Delhi. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court this week, in a verdict in another case, spoke out strongly on the issue of bail. In the Satender Kumar Antil vs. CBI case, the Supreme Court reiterated that bail is the rule and jail is an exception. The court said that in a democracy, there can never be an impression of police state. The court added that arrest is draconian measure resulting in curtailment of liberty and should be used sparingly. The Supreme Court also urged the government to consider enactment of a bail act. The Supreme Court said long back in 1978, following the, the, the constitution of India, that Jail is an exception and bail is the rule. I'm sorry to say that even the courts have forgotten this dictum of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court itself has forgotten the dictum. And that is what then filters down to different courts. So bail is no longer the rule. The Supreme Court has time and again reiterated that the bail and not jail principle 
but in recent times police across India are seen to be filing multiple FIRs and executing arrests which goes against the spirit of natural justice. With Anisha Mathur, Nalini Sharma, Munish Pandey, Bureau Report, India Today. Now, as that story said, in the last couple of months, the police across states have been filing multiple FIRs to target specific individuals, often individuals on the wrong side of the political establishment. Mohammad Zubair is the latest case, co-founder of Alt News, facing FIRs in UP and Delhi. Now, these are both BJP-ruled states, or Delhi, certainly the police comes under the Home Ministry. Ketki Chitre, actor in Maharashtra, was named in as many as 22 FIRs for allegedly criticizing Sharad Pawar, and she spent more than a month in jail. Nupur Sharma, suspended BJP spokesperson, was booked in several states for her comments on a TV show. West Bengal, lookout notice, Delhi, Assam, Maharashtra, Bihar, Jammu and Kashmir, across several states. Then you had the Congress MLA, Jignesh Mevani. He too was booked in multiple FIRs in Assam, arrested late at night from Gujarat and was flown to Assam where fresh charges were added against him. Lena Mani Mekalai, the filmmaker who made a film recently or documentary on Kali is now facing multiple FIRs, Delhi, Assam, UP over the controversial film post. And I'll come to many other such cases in a moment. But I want to raise the question tonight. Multiple FIRs, are they being weaponized? Is it being used as a weapon to target people? Are the police arresting under political pressure? Are the judges failing to enforce the bail not jail rule? Is the law selective? in high-profile cases and the way they deal with them. Con Colin Gonzalez has been Mohammad Zubair's lawyer. He's a senior advocate, Supreme Court. Aman Lekhi is senior advocate, Supreme Court, former additional solicitor general of India. A.L. Banerjee is former DGP UP. Neeraj Kumar, former police commissioner, Delhi. So we've got two cops and two lawyers. We're missing the judge, but I will play judge, therefore. Zubair, lawyer, Colin Gonzalez to you first. Multiple FIRs in a single case, the, uh, the, others, the prosecution is claiming that we are filing these FIRs because of several tweets in Zubair's case. Now, how is Zubair's case, in your view, different from a Nupur Sharma, who also has had several FIRs filed against her, and when she went to the Supreme Court to quash it, the Supreme Court said, no, we are not quashing it. So she may tomorrow have to go from Bengal to Assam to Maharashtra because identical FIRs get filed. Who do you hold responsible and how are these cases different? Well, the basic difference is this. In Zubair's case, you may have seven FIRs or six FIRs, but they are actually common. Common in the sense that they have a common thread, which is that in Zubair's case, he does not speak against any religion. He's speaking against those who are speaking against religion. So the hate speeches, he is asking the courts and the police to control them. So Zubair's FIRs will have a common thread. And that is, has he spoken against religion? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. Has he engaged in hate speech? The answer is no. And no, but in Nupur, no, no, uh, Colin Gonzalez in Nupur Sharma's case or a Ketki Chitre's case. Ketki Chitre allegedly just shared a few social media posts for which she spent 40 days in jail with 22 FIRs being filed across, uh, against her in Maharashtra. Nupur Sharma makes one comment on a TV show and she has a dozen FIRs filed against her across India. Is that the way forward? Just let me, let me just uh, make the nuance in this. I won't mention names. Mm -hmm. He mentioned Zubair's case. He's fighting against hate speech. In the case of those actually engaging in hate speech, mm -hmm. and at multiple levels and in different gatherings, and of the most venomous kind, shoot him, kill him, rape her, you will find there will be no FIRs at all. And if multiple FIRs are filed for people making hate speech, they should be made to run from court to court to court for every single hate speech. It's the way the law works. If you're so bold because you have the backing of government and the police, mm -hmm. so you think you can go to this meeting, a hate speech, that meeting, hate speech, 
Of course, you will have different FIRs filed against you. Nupur and Sharma, the is no, right no, with due regard, Colin Gonzalez, Nupur Sharma made a statement in one TV show. It could be one single FIR lumped together. You also have the case of Ketki Chitre. She says one media post, but every district police in Maharashtra goes and files FIRs against her. The point I'm making, I just want to press you one more time. Do you yeah. agree in general as a principle? Multiple FIRs are an instrument of harassment. No, let me explain this. If you have multiple FIRs in respect of a single statement, they must be clubbed and heard together. That is obvious. You can't have the same case going on here, there and everywhere. So Nupur Sharma so falls within that. Clubbed, they must be heard together in a single court and a single judge. Mm -hmm. But every case of hate speech becomes, then that can't be clubbed. In every case of hate speech, mm -hmm. multiple hate speeches will be multiple cases across the country. Okay. But a single instance, one case, one place, that's the rule. You know, Aman Lekhi, look at this case of Zubair. 2018 tweet is used in 2022 to arrest him. The moment he is arrested, then fresh charges are suddenly filed against him. First you arrest, then charges start getting piled up against him. FCRA violations, more tweets are found, all of which suddenly seem to appear across Uttar Pradesh. Do you agree, therefore, that at least Dupur Sharma has not been put in jail? Mohammed Zubair, as of today, is in prison for tweets of three and four year old tweets and multiple FIRs being filed. One day he's in Hathras, one day in Lakhimpur, Kheri. He gets bail in one place, but he's in jail in another case. Isn't this harassment and an attempt being made to intimidate or send a chilling effect? Uh, well, Rajdeep, uh, I agree with you. However, there's a caveat, and I want to make a preparatory statement. Mm -hmm. One, uh, and this is very material. Uh, the claim to sacred of the Hindus to the gods is in any way uh, not inferior to the claim which other religionists make. And if an object is trivialized, the profanity is not in any way less because the subject matter is Hindu. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel that this difference is being lost uh, across communities. And the instance is also Zubair because as far as comment is concerned, a comment, a criticism need not necessarily have religious overtones. And when we talk about religious violence in this country, we are not going to talk about religious violence in the physical sense also. We talk about violence in the psychological sense and tweets like these demean and depersonalize people and therefore are as much religious violence and come within the meaning of what I call fighting words which are outside constitutional protection. That said, what you mentioned that a belated registration of FIR mm -hmm. suggests that insofar as the institution is concerned, the institution of criminal proceedings, it's not directly linked to the offending tweet because that should have been, there should have been an immediate action. Mm -hmm. And because of the belated registration, what is actually an objectionable tweet gets a justification. And we have people actually uh, claiming that this is actually harassment, what you are talking about, weaponization. The larger issue here is the bond of restraint. And I personally find that uh, insofar as each community is concerned, each community is culpable in this lack of restraint that is shown. And we, for reasons which are not uh, easy to ascertain, mm -hmm. somehow whenever we have to make a political comment, we have a religious overtone to it which, which in some way distorts the comment and complicates the problem. Here you have flagged a very important issue, the role of the state. And the role of the state is very material because I just want no, the uh, thing which I think I, all of us should know. Uh, there are certain Aman stock Lekhi, cases. The role of the like state part. seems to, sorry to intervene, the role of the state which you may, which you are, is, is to settle scores. That's the worry. That because a particular person has to be targeted, you'll have an opposition rule state which I, when the MBA Maharashtra Vikas Agadi was in power in Maharashtra, they targeted a Marathi actor Ketki Chitre because she allegedly shared a social media post that was anti Sharad Pawar. Now you will have a, a, a case of Mohammed Zubair because he is taking on Hindutva groups or is seen to take on Hindutva groups. You have BJP ruled states targeting him. This is not the way a country can run. No, as, as if law is weaponized for political ends, that is the abuse of law and makes the proceeding vexatious. But it's and happening. that is precisely the point which I am making. What I am saying is the manner in which a wrong is dealt with, if the method is wrong, mm -hmm. then the wrong actually goes into oblivion because the focus becomes on the manner of enforcing it. And that's where the problem is coming because law is discredited for the wrong reasons. 
Okay. Law is discredited because the manner in which law is invoked and the wrong with, with which the law has to actually deal with remains unredressed. In Zubair's case, I personally feel educated people, when they make comment, should do it with discretion and should avoid provocative statements like the one which he made. And the ease with these comments are made should be avo avoided because in a surcharge atmosphere, an alternative method of conveying an opinion would be appropriate. Sir, However, and which you are sir, very right, sir, I'm, I'm, when the state yes, go ahead. institutes proceedings, yes, go ahead, sir. When the state institutes proceedings the way it has happened in Zubair's case, the belated institution discredits them. And it is when the belated institution discredits them, the focus goes to the institution, the proceeding, and not to the wrong. And therefore, there are two wrongs which are over there. The wrong by the state, which is unpardonable because as the state is concerned, the state has always been on the right side of the law. Right. And the wrong which is committed, which remains unaddressed because the focus goes to the main way in which the state has addressed it. And here the methodology which is adopted and which this channel must actually highlight, we have certain stock provisions. We have 153A, we have 295A, we have 505. What is missed is, and that is why you can't have a proliferation of sections, you cannot have 153A with 295A. I'm surprised this point has not been taken because they are distinct. One is going to public tranquility, the other is going to religion. As far as Zubair's tweet is concerned, yes. Zubair's, Zubair's tweet, in so far as the prosecution should have been concerned, should have been only under 295A and not under 153. And where 295A is, the requirement of law is sanction. Now when the requirement of law is sanction for cognizance, I feel, considering the manner in which these proceedings are now being repeatedly instituted, instead of there being sanctioned at a time of cognizance, they should be sanctioned at a time of decision of fire, because precedent of this is not known, so, that's so that the state has to intervene, because it goes to basically a matter of public policy and state interest, whether prosecution is at all warranted or not, and there is provision in law for preliminary investigation. So there should be preliminary investigation and a sanction at the time of decision of FIR, rather than awaiting cognizance, so that because in the meanwhile, the very raise in tempers is bound to, bound to happen, may distort discourse altogether. So there has to be restraint. Law sir, that must be used is, for the purposes for which is law giving? is actually put in place. May and you are very correct. There should be no belated institution, no weaponization. You know, the, but the fact is you are giving an ideal situation. I am giving you what is actually happening. In each of these cases, you are having FIRs being filed and arrests being uh, taking place and then charges being added later on. Let me bring you in, Mr. Banerjee, because, you know, it's the Uttar Pradesh police in this case, which is in the dock in a way, according to me, an SIT is now being appointed of top police officers to look into his tweets. Top IPS officers are going to have a special investigation team. Is that what is the role of IPS officers? And SIT has to be appointed and cases are filed across the state. Maharashtra does it with the Ketki Chitale, where there was an opposition ruled state. UP does it where there is a BJP ruled state. And that's the problem. FIRs are being used as a weapon. Why should the police first go and arrest him? First investigate, find out whether charges are made out and then go and arrest. None of these charges require immediate arrest, surely. Rajdeep, what has happened in this particular case is, UP police has gone ahead and arrested Zubair based on one FIR. And subsequently there were more FIRs after that. So the point is that when the police arrest a person, normally it is assumed that they have sufficient evidence and record to say that, yes, this man should be in jail and uh, he should not be out on tweet. bail. Mr. Uh, Mr. Banerjee, let's let's you know let's not stretch incredulity. For a four-year-old tweet, the police feels there's an immediate need to arrest. This obsession with arrest—that's the problem. Here is the courts have said repeatedly: jail not ba uh, bail, not jail. We should not become a police state, but we are becoming a police state. The police is happily going around the country arresting on behest of their political masters, whether it's that, Congress ruled or whether it's BJP ruled. Yes, it is a it is a high-profile case. Uh, the undoubtedly, and so what's what the need to arrest? That in any, a, whenever an FIR is lo, uh, lodged, yes, the top officers or all the supervisory officers, they are very keen to see that arrests are made. Even the in, investigating officer, why? Wants some, beg your pardon. Why? Why should the police be in this haste to arrest? That's the problem. That's how the we become a police state. The, the police has to act according to the FIR, and once an FIR is lodged. They believe that the FIR is true. Believing that the FIR is true, they work accordingly and they start uh, investigating accordingly. 
you just raised this question about SIT. Mm -hmm. Now, SIT is a special investigation team mm -hmm. which will only look after this, this particular case or these cases. You see, now, the, what is the role of an IPS officer? You just questioned. <laughs> the uh, role of an IPS officer is to supervise cases, okay. to oversee. No, no, my point the, was, sir, my point, I'll, I'll, you know, to have an SIT in a case like this is, seems a bit overstretched, but let's come out of Zubair to the overall picture. I want to bring you in Neeraj Kumar, because in 2020, which is the last year for which statistics are av available, 1,834 people in this country have been arrested either for social media statements or, re or, or remarks that they have made in the public domain. Many of these people need not be arrested. This is, these are not necessarily provisions which you need immediate arrest. Politicians make all kinds of inflammatory remarks in their, in their public speeches that could again uh, inflame religious passion. Nobody goes immediately to arrest them. But when there is a citizen, you immediately arrest. 1,834 is the police also now FIR happy, if I may call it, like trigger happy. They are also FIR happy. Chalo, FIR hai, arrest kar do. Yes, go ahead. Sir, you are on mute, sir. You are on mute. You are on mute. I, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. It's unacceptable that uh, today arrests mm. follow automatically after mm. the registration of an FIR, mm. which should not happen. Because more than anything else, mm. it is a complete uh, negation of the entire principles behind arrest uh, and also the fact that uh, you know you are dealing with the reputation of a person you arrest uh, a person and his reputation for all time to come is totally gone later he gets bailed later he gets acquitted and uh, but in the bargain his reputation goes in fact uh, i wrote a detailed article uh, on this subject in one of the leading newspapers that arrest should be very, very spare, done very sparingly and keeping everything in mind and only when it is absolutely necessary. So why are they being so done? So then why, so sorry to, then why are they being done so often? Why do you think, is it, has something changed? Is the police under pressure from their political bosses to arrest specific individuals? And here I'm saying across parties, Arnab Goswami, the manner in which he was picked up, the series of cases that were filed against an Arnab Goswami, or whether the, uh, a, a, a journalist just recently of Z News, Chhattisgarh police landing up, or a Jignesh Mevani being picked up in the night from Gujarat. What is the pressure? Uh, Rajdeep, I cannot answer your question. Uh, we can only speculate and we can only say that this has happened or that has happened. But nobody knows the true facts. What was the motivation behind the arrest of uh, Arnab Goswami or what was the uh, motivation behind not arresting some other people who had made mm -hmm. uh, statements which were uh, purportedly inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I cannot uh, answer that question, what exactly the motivation was. But suffice it to say that the police, as you are rightly pointing out, mm -hmm. should act you know, just as has been prescribed under the law, and it should keep all uh, you know, sensitivities into mind mm -hmm. before jumping into uh, a precipitate action like arresting somebody. Okay. There's no two opinion about that. Okay, so you're However, saying the police should be very cautious before taking this action, but Colin Gonzalez, what about the judges, particularly lower court judges, who seem also more than happy? To, uh, to, uh, to allow the arrest to take place. We saw this even in uh, the case of Shah Rukh Khan's son, the manner in which it was done. Now, uh, you know, the NCB has, has been on the back foot. But in general, there's a sense that without providing even sufficient evidence before the court prima facie, the first thing that the judge says, uh, police custody uh, granted, and then judicial custody is given. 15, 20 days of a person's life and liberty go. In the case of others who don't have influence, it can go on for years. You're absolutely right, uh, Rajdeep. You're absolutely right. And I hope the recent judgment of the Supreme Court delivered four days ago, mm. which reiterates the, the, uh, the judgment in Arnesh Kumar, if the crime is such that the maximum sentence is seven years or less, mm. there must be no arrest. Mm. And in all these cases, Zubair and some other cases, 153A, 295A 
are five years and less. There was no chance for them to rest at all. And I hope this judgment which came recently, and Arnesh Kumar, of course, is years ago, I hope for the first time, I hope the police begin to follow that judgment mm -hmm. and the courts begin to follow. And the Supreme Court says the officer should be punished mm -hmm. if he arrests anyone when the maximum sentence calls for seven years or less. So Can't. Seven years or less, you cannot arrest. That's I hope they punish officers now for arresting people for such crimes. In fact, the, the Supreme, Supreme Court has also called for a new bail law, but there's also a selectivity, Aman Lekhi. I mentioned uh, Mr. Goswami's case. In that case, the Supreme Court's vacation bench met and said the individual liberty must be protected and did so. But there are other cases where the court will not meet for because Arnab was a high-profile television anchor. But if I'm not a high-profile television anchor, I will have to spend days in jail. And then the Supreme Court doesn't intervene. So there seems to be selectivity at all levels in the manner in which a case is played up or played down, intervention of the courts. Has that also got to end? Could one way be, as Colin is saying, if the charge is less than seven years, then it will be extreme circumstances under which the police can arrest or not arrest at all. No, absolutely. Please you see what is very important is, and I mean, I, I'll slight, disagree slightly with what Mr. Gonzalez has said. But now let me put it uh, in my words. One, mm -hmm. the power of arrest is different from necessity of arrest. Mm -hmm. Now, mainly because this power doesn't necessarily mean you arrest. Mm -hmm. That means to justify the arrest, there has to be need. Now, need goes to investigation. As the investigation is concerned, you'll have to justify why you need. That is, you want to recover something, you want to get a statement, you want to confront a person. Or you are just want, in some way disposed for ensuring that there is no repetition. That is the general broad principle in which arrest is justified. Unless those conditions are there, the warrant for arrest is non-existent and the law in this regard is very well settled. The law is not that if it is less than seven years, then there should not be no arrest. All the law says is when it's less than seven years, there should be reasons. But what the distinction the law makes between seven and more than seven is in my opinion irrelevant because in every arrest, and that is the law because Article 21 will warrant it, they cannot and should not be arrested without reasons. One. Two. As far as you mentioned very correctly, the role of the magistrates. Now, role of the magistrates, insofar as remand is concerned, is premised on what is called a case diary. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the case diary is concerned, remand can never be mechanical. That is, the magistrate concerned has to look into it, keeping in view the necessity. Again, not the power, but the necessity of remand. And you are were, very correct. Police remand should not necessarily be taken as a matter of recourse. Mm -hmm. but it's not police remand. Once a person is custody, whether it's police remand or judicial remand, the person remains in custody. The only issue is the difference in custody. One is in the police, the other is in the jail. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, the discretion must have the discretion of the police, so the discretion of the magistrate. Which brings me to the third point, the role of the superior courts. Now, the role of the superior courts, they are actually the holders of the conscience and uphold the rule of law and basically courts of last resort to ensure that as far as part 3, where Article 21 is concerned, our fundamental rights are concerned, our fundamental rights are held sacred. Now, much in the same manner, there has to be discretion of the police, there has to be a discretion of the magistrate, there has to be a higher discretion of the superior courts, because it is in the superior courts that the ultimate resort to protection of fundamental right, right. prevails. And if, as you are pointing out, there is a general perception, and this perception hasn't started now. The perception has in various terrorist cases, where people have complained, see the Supreme Court is open at night, to have a special hearing for the terrorists, why? Sir, I'm and not you are mentioning now sir, that as far as Arnab Goswami is concerned, they have granted relief. Sir, that was a death penalty terrorist case. I am talking uh, about I can't cases. hear you. Uh, sir, I am talking about section 153, 295. No, My the point is, is these are cases uh, surely uh, that are the immediately available. Is, the context is the comment. The context is the assumption. The context is the perception. Okay. Now, there has to be, and this is in life as in law, perception is extremely important. Because it is through perception that we assess. And if the general perception becomes negative, then the credibility of the institution in some way denigrates. And once the credibility goes, the confidence goes along with it. And if there is no confidence in the law enforcement mechanism, then there will be complete anarchy. So at every level, the right. question is discretion. And discretion keeping in view the lodestar, lodestar is the law. No, sir, but I, I, I again come back and therefore the problem is while judges, magistrates need to be cautious, Mr. Banerjee, so does the police. 
we cannot have the surely the ips officers at least can start saying no to politicians instead of accepting going to arrest a jignesh mewani at midnight taking him to assam and then putting out fresh cases that he tried to uh, assault our lady constables just so that he spends a few more days in jail is this what you all were taught in the ips to put my my grandfather was an old ip officer he would be shocked you want to put people for more days in jail simply to satisfy your political bosses maharashtra did it with ketki chitle uh, and 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 now up seems to be doing it with mohammad zubair is that what we want in this country is that why you all became ips officers no not really not really uh, <coughs> when one joined the ips you had great regard for the service and also towards what you were going to do we i have done it i feel that i have been fairly fair and square in what i had did however the problem with the state enforcing the uh, police or asking the police to enforce arrests mm -hmm. to ensure that there are arrests is a different matter every every government wants that any fir which is lodged mm -hmm. at least arrests are made and these arrests are counted as good work or not good work now when uh, this zubair ahmed was arrested by sitapur police the other uh, other districts where these cases were registered they just went and served a warrant on this guy so they didn't even actually arrest him so, sir he is at the moment as i said moving therefore from police station to police station ketki chitle spent 41 days in jail we've had other cases where in bengal also someone has been picked up from goa because uh, he allegedly in a youtube a post attacked mamta banerji picked up overnight from goa brought to bengal this must stop as as has been said by the supreme court bail not jail we cannot become a police state and allow these wrongful arrest 30 seconds to you neeraj kumar will anything change or do you think things will get worse before they get better given the nature of our political class and just how partisan they are becoming uh we can only hazard a guess guess uh, uh rajdeep see none of us neither mr banerji nor i can say for sure what exactly was the motivation uh, of the police when they went ahead and uh, arrested you are also saying these things you are making uh, Uh, assumption mm -hmm. making a guess that the police has acted on the instructions of uh, the political masters right and that is why they have acted the way they have done you know uh, one cannot be sure whether the police acted on its own for instance in the case of mohammed zubair yes mohammed zubair is not only a case of a lo one lone tweet that man has a history the police if it has acted in a certain way there may be the intent come on maybe. sir come on sir <laughs> two weeks after he takes on a nupur sharma suddenly you tell he has a history for god's sake mr no, neeraj no. kumar this is See, this is what, the problem no, no, sir when you, senior police officers are also going to speak this language no, for god's no, sake please i am a for a four year old tweet no, you're going I'm to just jump up and down then you might as well no, you you will flood please. our prisons Look you at the way to... some of our IT selves of political parties spread hate and fake news. No one touches them. Look at the fact that the additional solicitor general of the country, sir, no less, in the same case, defends a a a a a, a monk who had virtually Rajdeep. advocated rape against Muslim women. Rajdi, I was only taking a contrarian view. Okay. Uh, just for the sake of discussion, I am not saying that whatever you have said or. Whatever the general feeling of the panelists is, I'm not going. I'm just taking a okay. contrarian view for the sake of discussion. So, so should the police and make that? So, 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 just a minute. Should the police then make these view whenever they uh, put out such an arrest, provide the hard evidence? Don't just go by. Should, you know, they, they must provide more than just an FIR. The 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 courts, including the Delhi High Court today, has given uh, enumerated ten points right. while giving bail. the if the police case was absolutely bogus then the uh, court could have uh, you know discharged the man right to have castigated the police could have passed strictures against the police nothing of the sort has happened okay let so me leave it there sir i'm i'm going to leave it there uh, because i've run completely out of time but i i wish we had much more time on this because it's time i think that all of us faced the mirror
particularly the police, particularly magistrates and indeed lawyers, those who are in charge of our criminal justice system. This cannot go on. For now, I thank my guests. We need a new bail law, my friends, in this country and I hope it comes sooner rather than later. But will our parliament do that? Will they bite the hand that feeds them? Vendetta politics, unprofessional police is leading, I am afraid, to a situation that we find ourselves in. Let's turn from there to our other big story because Indian origin British MP Rishi Sunak continues to lead the race to 10 Downing Street. Sunak has a majority support from the Tories. He garnered 101 votes in the second round of voting. But will he really bag the top job? Our next report tells us more and then we'll go to our guests in London. Rishi Sunak is getting closer and closer to 10 Downing Street. The 42-year-old Indian origin Brit has won the first two rounds of voting for the Conservative Party leadership and now appears to have the endorsement of the Tories to take Boris Johnson's job. I'm so grateful you're all willing to give up your time to help us restore trust, rebuild our economy and reunite our country. Thanks also to all my colleagues who have supported me so far. I know that working together, we can bring our party together and beat Labour. Fantastic. Um, if our new Prime Minister was someone of Indian heritage, I'm sure that will play a part in some of the decisions made on who to back. In the second round of voting on Thursday, Johnson's former Finance Minister got 101 votes. Closest to him were Penny Mordaunt with 83 votes and Foreign Minister Liz Truss with 64 votes. Another Indian origin contender, Suella Braverman fell out of the race in round two. Going into round three, there are now five left in contention, with Sunak clearly having the edge. Only a late rally by Liz Truss or Penny Mordaunt, who enjoys significant support from Conservative Party's grassroots, can stop Britain from getting its first Indian origin Prime Minister. But as I know many viewers in India will know, yes. Liz Truss is a great friend of India. She's got a reputation on the world stage. She's been a great Foreign Secretary. She'll be a great Prime Minister. According to the timetable set by the 1922 Committee of Tory backbenchers, the deadline to shortlist two remaining candidates is July 21st. The candidate who receives the most votes will be elected the new Conservative Party leader and British Prime Minister on September 5th. Close to 200,000 people will be electing the uh, Prime Minister of this country who could be Rishi Sunak and that is an absolutely exciting and historic moment in this country truly representative of the way this country is going. It has such diverse cultures and it is represented in the candidates that are remaining as of now as well. And if Rishi Sunak does become the Prime Minister of this country, he'll be the first Indian origin, rather first Asian origin person to be the Prime Minister of Britain. Levine Nathandon for India Today from London. So will Rishi Sunak make it? Joining me now for a quick reaction, Lord Rami Ranger, CBE, Member of the House of Lords uh, in the United Kingdom. Appreciate your joining us. Do you believe uh, Rishi Sunak can make it at the moment or do you believe, as the bookmakers are suggesting, Penny Mordaunt remains the front runner? I think Rishi has every chance to succeed because he has no baggage and the, he has a lot of popularity in the parliament. His, Colleagues are supporting him and also know that mm -hmm. he, being an Indian origin, has to work harder than the other people to prove himself. Mm -hmm. And he has demonstrated that he has been a great chancellor during the most difficult time brought about by pa uh, COVID pandemic. And that time he showed his vision. He helped small businesses. Mm -hmm. He saved livelihood. And, you know, the people are appreciative that he was also able to give a lot of money to the national health to have the unprecedented COVID vaccine roller program which gave the British people freedom to go about their businesses. And this is the time. Right. And you know, the, the, the world knows 
that the Indians are a force to be reckoned with. All the blue chip companies are now run by Indian. They, if we don't have to prove ourselves, we've already proved ourselves. We've been here, you know, 50, 60 years, and we have worked hard. No, so I, I, are you saying, are you saying that his Indian, being of Indian origin, is his, is an advantage to him in this race? Very much so. India now is a flavor of the world. You know, I remember the day when I could not get a loan to start do my business, you know, because I was Indian. Now I'm Indian. I have queues of banks trying to do business with me because they know Indians are reliable people, hardworking, honest, and they have similar values what the British people enjoy. So we are uh, very close to one another and right. Indians are no stranger to Great Britain. You know, the, the other view, of course, is that while Rishi Sunak's colleagues are supporting him, uh, the party members, the nearly 900 party members of the Conservative Party would prefer a penny more down. That I even read a comment that Rishi is too wealthy, in a way, too rich for us at the moment. How do you, how do you react to that, that the party would prefer someone safer like Penny Mordor? First of all, Rishi is, Rishi is not rich, his wife is rich. You know, to be a rich is not a crime. If she inherited some wealth from her parents, mm -hmm. which is normal, this is not abnormal. Rishi has not broken any law. He has not done any business which can bring, uh, you know, a bad name to his family or to himself. Right. So Rishi is ma is a very hardworking guy, like ordinary people. He started as a uh, uh, work in a city, and he worked his way up. Then he joined the uh, po uh, po politics, and he was a member of parliament. Then he showed his flavor. He's highly educated. He's a, uh, studied in America, studied in the United Kingdom. And he has got that ambition, right. because the ambition is what drives people. You know, it's, it's the motivation comes from his ambition. He wants to prove, and I'm sure he will get his chance, because the British people have now very ethnic friendly. They have changed. They enjoy our so country. You're, so you're they, saying in a way, Rishi Sunak will become a symbol of a new multicultural England. And that's why you believe Rishi Sunak has a real chance to get the Conservative Party leadership. Let me leave it there. We'll, of course, keep no, tracking I, this with you, Lord, Lord uh, because there'll be many more days. Uh, there'll be another round next week. And we'll keep building up. Thanks very much for now to join Thank me you. there from London. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's turn to the story uh, which has uh, dominated the headlines in the last few days. The monsoon that continues to sweep several parts of the country, spreading havoc and destruction. Gujarat, Maharashtra, Uttarakhand, all experiencing heavy rains even now. So far over a hundred people have lost their lives in Maharashtra alone. Uttarakhand has suffered landslides. Roads still blocked. Many villages have lost connectivity. In southern India, Telangana and Karnataka remain the worst suffering states. In Gujarat, Navsari district is among the worst hit uh, in southern Gujarat. Many villages there are still underwater. And today's story comes from Navsari, where the road from Navsari, which leads into Mumbai, has been almost completely cut off. Take a look. In Gujarat, Navsari, over a hundred villagers are stuck in their homes for the last five days without food and water. A miraculous rescue operation was conducted by NDRF teams in Bhata village in Napsari, saving just in time women and children who were stuck. Several of the villagers are completely trapped inside this particular village and the officials are finding it very difficult to in fact reach those places. Let me tell you, for past four to five days the villages are completely trapped. They don't have any food or water or any supplies from them. So far, 80 lives have been lost in the floods in Gujarat. Time is running out and rescue teams have to reach submerged houses across villages to save those still trapped. A red alert has also been issued in eight districts of Gujarat, including Valsad, which is the worst affected. Not just civilians, but livestock and crops have also been largely affected, with 100 tons of grains completely destroyed after water entered shops and caused heavy losses.
टोटल माल है उसका पचास टका डेमेज हो गया यहाँ शायद सौ से डेढ़ सौ होलसेलर अनाज के व्यापारी है तो सबको पूरा लॉस हुआ Monsoon mayhem leaves many questions to be answered. How much of the natural disaster is man-made because of poor planning and illegal constructions? With Saurav Vaktanya from Navsari, Gujarat, Dev Kotak from Valsad, Gujarat. And our thoughts today and prayers with all those in those affected areas. Amidst all these grim news around us, our image of the day ahead of the weekend comes from Thailand that's gone viral across the world. A mother elephant fainted due to stress after her calf was stuck in a mud pit drain amidst non-stop rainfall. She was unable to bring him back up. Rescue officials, the national park did uh, CPR, revived the mother and helped the baby jumbo out of the ditch. That's a story that should melt every heart. It's uh, happy news and those wonderful images tell you that there is something called Hati Mere Sati. Think about it. You stay well, stay safe, and uh, thanks for watching the news without the noise. Bye for now. Jai Hind, Shubhratri, Namaskar.